Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me at the event. Um, I'm new to FSU. I'm new to Tallahassee. I, my personal work, I work as a sculptor, and my background is, is more digital-based, being in advertising and graphic design. Over the years, that's evolved and it's changed. And um, as was said, here at FSU, I teach um, digital foundations classes and um, right now sculpture classes. So I do, I do a bit of everything. So in putting this talk together, I wanted to, I really wanted to kind of tell a story of how I got to this point and where I see it going. So this idea of using a bigger digital hammer, this idea of using a hammer in the first place, um, is that, is that the, um, the root of this? First, I have a couple disclaimers. This is a shed, and in that shed are many, many, many sharp tools. Very smart tools, a lot of them do, do different things. I don't really belong in the shed a lot. I am not a, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a software person, I'm an artist who uses these as tools. Given that, I know where this shed is, and I, I love the shed, and I go to the shed a lot, and I hang out with these people. They let me say things now and then, and we share ideas, and then I leave all the sharp tools in the shed. I am not referring to my colleagues as tools. <laughs> <laughs> They're just in the shed, and I visit them when I need ideas. Basically, I surround myself with the smartest people I know. And being here, albeit only for a couple months so far, I find myself at FSU being surrounded by some of the smartest people I've ever met. And that's a perfect place for me. Influences. The, the idea of, of being influenced as an artist and trying to figure out where that comes from is always a challenge. And oftentimes, the very basis of what people base their art on. So for me, I went back to the one book that as a child was so incredibly influential, and it was this. It was Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. Um, I actually had a couple years ago, I found this in a bookstore, and it reminded me of what I loved about it. It's a story of technology replacing what was considered a, a worthless piece of technology. His steam shovel, not considered efficient enough, gasoline steam shovels were coming over, they were all being thrown down the cliff. It was very sad. Um, I, I won't spoil the whole story for you. It has somewhat of a happy ending. It has a very happy ending. But what I realized as an adult revisiting this influence was, this is Mike. This is a little boy who never has a name in the book. And the steam show was called Marianne. And I realized as an adult that the, the person I was identifying with in this story was Marianne the steam shovel. Not the guy operating it, not the little kid who saves a day, but I was, I was identifying not just with the tool or the mechanized device, but the one thing that served the greatest purpose. And as a child, I, I didn't realize that's what I was grasping onto. So, another influence this Winky, the deer that you would draw, and Winky along with Lucky, the duck, I think it was Tippy the turtle, the pirate, kitten and boxer, and cowboy, these were all my nemesis as a child. Because they mocked me from the back of comic books and magazines to try and draw them, to try and be as good as everyone else. And what resulted from that was me not trying to do it. Even though I wanted to and I had this passion to do it, I didn't have the skill. I didn't understand the process. So at a very young age, having a, a nemesis that is a, a deer in the back of a magazine was slightly unsettling. On the other hand, there was this guy. <laughs> Bob, this, this gentle, afroed, cooing man 
would, would call to me from TV sets. And he would tell me to take my thirsty brush and make a happy cloud and do all these things. And I would try. I would sit in front of a TV set with a paintbrush and try and just imitate what he was doing. Try and bring something that was inside that television onto a canvas. And it never worked because I wanted to be as good as him immediately. And I didn't have this comprehension that it doesn't work that way. It takes years. You have to learn the tools. You have to learn techniques. I wanted it immediately. So again, I gave up. Now, the backstory to the giving up is based on the culture that I was brought up in and, and the, this order that was in my life and the fact that I was, I was trained to do what I was told. And I was trained to do the right thing and be good at it. But in this respect, because I couldn't achieve this, this greatness or this perfection right off the bat, it, it all resulted from not knowing that there was a process. And this process involves tools. And this process involves time. Experimentation. All things I had no idea that even existed and play. And these are things to this very day that I employ in my work and I push to my students as well. Part of playing is failing. There's, there's no growth, there's no expansion of thought, no expansion of ideas without immense amounts of failure. And when any of us go to an art gallery or see a show, you're seeing the one result, that end piece, the one that was perfect. But for that, I guarantee there are dozens, dozens upon dozens that didn't make the cut. So if play equals failure, failure equals learning. And this is what scares people so much, and especially nowadays as technology goes faster and faster. We think of failure as being the past, then the next step, that next step after you make a mistake is the future, is your future. If you're walking down the street and you trip over a crack and you fall down, the next time you're walking down that street, you remember it and you don't fall down. Um, Jacob Ranowski in his The Origins of Knowledge and Imagination refers to this as the internalization of language. And as far as we know, this is, this is one thing that truly separates us from every other living thing on the planet. This idea that we have this internal dialogue, that we see, we see what it is that happened, we remember it, and we either make it happen again, or we avoid it. We make these decisions based on what's happened before. When I went to my undergraduate, school in Detroit, my degree was in graphic communication. It wasn't graphic design. And this was really important. I didn't realize this either at the time. I was being trained, I was being given the tools, the tools of visual acuity, the tools of graphic balance, the tools of color theory, all these tools under this umbrella of communication, of problem solving. And then this happened. And it was a great thing, but it changed everything. And now I had come from one world that was absolutely tactile. It was everything we did was based on making marks on paper. That's what it was. Once Apple came out, everything changed, and there was a paradigm shift in the art world, in the graphics world, the way we thought about what we were making changed dramatically. And if you don't know what a paradigm shift looks like, it looks like that, which is a, a Mac 2 computer. At the time, they cost about $5,000. If you want a color monitor, that's $10,000. So, and I don't remember the exact processing power on this, but I can pretty much bet that the the phone in my pocket right now has at least 50 times the processing power of this computer. And, and my phone is two years old, so you can probably double that. So 
I go through undergraduate, I learn all these tools, computers come out, and now it's, there's just a free-for-all. Everything has changed. All the rules are different. People are scattering from advertising agencies. This was one computer that was an advertising agency that I worked at. I was an art director there. This computer sat on a table in a hallway next to a copier, between a copier and a water cooler, actually. No one knew what to do with it. We didn't see the place it was going to take. But what it offered us in the ideal world and what we're, we were being sold was that it had expanded tools, expanded techniques, styles, freedom, and independence. All things artists want and all things artists crave. So this extremely unscientific chart, <laughs> this red line here represented a pretty traditional learning curve of a, a graphic artist at that time. You learned, you progressed, your productivity went up as your originality expanded. Computers came out and your productivity, just by nature of having that piece of equipment, you started way up here and you skyrocketed, but your originality was held back because everyone was defining themselves by the tool. And this is something that still happens today. This is actually pretty accurate in my mind. This is an accurate chart. The really accurate chart is this. This is still pretty normal. Because there were so many technological problems, everyone was trying to learn, everyone was trying new things, it just went berserk. Creativity was all over the place. Productivity would spike and then plummet because no one knew how to fix things. There were problems with files. Other people didn't have computers. Modems were ridiculous. It, it was just this amazing, beautiful technological meltdown and growth at the same time. Now, and within a few miles of this location, we have access to so many things. Microprocessors, Arduino, Raspberry Pis, programming languages such as processing and Python, 3D rapid pro prototyping, Megabots, z core 3D printers, m core 3D printers, CNC routers, laser cutters, and most importantly, for children, because these are the ones that I can relate to the most, <laughs> Scratch, Hackity Hack, Lego Mindstorms, these are tools that children are given not just to play with and not just to pass time with, but to expand themselves and to grow and also learn at the same time, but learn in a different way. The learning now has transferred from acquiring knowledge to acquiring ability to expand it even further. We rely on people now with open source software to move this educational curve higher and higher. But we have the same, the same parameters. We have expanded tools. We have techniques, styles, freedom, and independence. So we haven't changed what we've wanted. We've just expanded the playing field greatly. One thing that has happened, which, which I personally and fully embrace, is this ability to fail faster. You can go through so many iterations of an idea and you can get to where you want to go while exploring so much more. You don't have to spend so much time trying to see if something works or not. And the application. Longfellow has a quote, and I'll paraphrase, I'll probably get it wrong, about every man must either be an anvil or a hammer. So you're either that or you're that. And, it's, and I, I reject that quote. I think, and what I wish for everyone, is that you're neither the anvil nor the hammer, but you're the hand that swings the hammer to anvil to forge better, bigger, faster, more expansive, more inclusive tools, strategies, artistic endeavors. So, the other wish I would have is that everyone in their life has a chance to meet their nemesis face to face, to engage them, destroy them, embrace them, make them what they are, 
and move on and take that with you as much as you can. Thank you very much.